courses. But my talk today is based on research and it's also based on experience. Uh, traveling to many different parts of the world. Uh, let me begin with, since this is actually about um, race and racism, uh, whiteness as a power structure, you need to know a little bit about my personal background. I was born in a segregated place called South Carolina. And when I started school, my first two years, they're segregated schools, all black, um, teachers, students, and so forth. That was my world. Uh, my parents got divorced, and we moved to New York, which was a completely different world. Living in Harlem, in El Barrio, Spanish Harlem, uh, various places in Manhattan, I got to meet a whole lot of different people. So my world expanded exponentially from a um, a two-part world of black and white to a world of black, Latino, Asian, uh, and within those categories, um, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, at a very young age, seven, eight, nine, um, my whole world exploded. After finishing college, I went to West Africa, and that was another explosion because oftentimes people think of Africa as an entity. Um, the place that I went to, Sierra Leone, is smaller than Oregon, and it had 12 major ethnic groups. And so again, I got an experience of um, difference, um, but also uh, relative acceptance. And since then, I've traveled to a number of different places and experienced um, quite a bit of humanity. One of the things that I consider myself to be, because people often say, what, what are you, or who are you, and many people say, I'm an American, or I'm an Oregonian, et cetera, et cetera. I consider myself to be actually um, an earthling, a person of the world, which uh, some people find to be frightening. I, I sometimes think that the only time we're going to figure out that we're humans is when we're invaded from outer space. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're all humans. But we have beliefs, and whiteness is a concept of belief. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about that, and then ask you to imagine um, a world without whiteness. So, first of all, there are times that we believe things that are simply not true. And one example, I want you to think about this for a while. Something that you perhaps have learned in grade school about the world. So, and don't call out on this, but here's the question. How many continents are there? I'm sure you learned about that. And then the other question is, can you name them? Well, the teacher is always a quiz. <laughs> so can you name them? Okay, and I said not to, to go out. So if you said seven, you are absolutely wrong. <laughs> continent is a huge body of land. There are six huge bodies of land. And you probably think, no, I'm like this other And then you get to Europe and Asia. And Europe and Asia is one land mass. Continent, I used to teach geography, a continent is a huge body of land separated from others, or almost separated. Europe is not separated. But probably in school you learn that Europe and Asia are separated by the Ural Mountains. Check out Mr. Webster. He says nothing about a mountain separating continents. <coughs> but we have come to believe that Europe is a continent because Europeans told us it was a continent. That in itself is part of the concept of whiteness. Europe is not a continent. It's a small part of Eurasia. And yet, for the longest time, and probably up until today, you believed it. And if you talk with people outside of this gathering, and you ask them, so how many continents are there? They'll say seven, and they'll rattle it off. And then you say, no, Europe is an continent. Oh, yes, it is. Because they learned it in the fifth grade. And they learned it well, but they learned it incorrectly. In the same way, and what I'm getting at is that sometimes we believe things that are absolutely not true, and yet we cling to them. Here's another example. 
does the Earth revolve around the Sun or vice versa? For hundreds of years, some people in Europe believed that the Earth was not only the center of the solar system, but the center of the universe, and everything revolved around the Earth. And when Copernicus and others said, well, you know, that's simply not true, there was this big pushback. Whenever there's a change, there's a pushback. That's not true. Because God put the Earth in the center of the universe. And we know that. And the sun goes around the Earth, and we know that. Because Joshua said, the sun will stand still. And it did. So we're not a little planet revolving. We're the most important planet. Now, today, if you ask folks that question, they'll say, the Earth revolves around the sun. So you would think, but a February 2014 National Science Foundation study involving 2,200 participants found that 25% of Americans got that wrong, or said it because they believed it, but it's absolutely not true. And by the way, we're better off than um, Western Europeans. One third of them thought that the sun revolved around the earth, and it's absolutely not true. So. <coughs> Imagine all the people living life in peace. John Lennon penned these words in 1971, and my interpretation is that he's talking about, imagine everyone living together in peace. That would be not necessarily a perfect world, but a good world. And how do we get to that good world is the question. A world without conflict. And to me, my interpretation of these words is it would be a world, or U.S., without whiteness in terms of the power structure. And so then the question would be, what is whiteness? Throughout this month, you're probably going to get definitions from various people as you go to different events. So let me share with you, so that we all have the same uh, standard, um, my belief about whiteness. But before that, before you can think about whiteness, and a lot of people do not, or have not, you need to be able to imagine it. So I'd like you to do something very dangerous right now. I'd like you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine an elephant. You've got the elephant. Now I'd like you to imagine. I presume everybody's able to imagine. Can you imagine a um, Kali? Okay, you can open your eyes. So, did you imagine a Kali? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that was the response. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Kali, by the way, is something you can imagine, but you didn't know it. It's a snake. Okay, that's in the, the Mende language. Kali, snake. But you couldn't imagine it because you didn't know it. And a lot of people cannot imagine whiteness because they don't know it. They don't see it. It is invisible. <coughs> but it's there all the time. So I'd like to share with you just a little of um, my thoughts about whiteness. And it, it is a social category for one. And a social category, is there any sociologists here? Don't correct me. <laughs> social category is a group of people who share common characteristics, but they may never interact with each other. But they are a social category. So, whiteness, white people share a whole lot of things, even if they don't interact. And one thing that they share is whiteness, or white privilege. 
And you may ask um, a poor white person, for example, like, I don't have any privileges. It's because the privilege is invisible. The privilege is that when you go into a store, someone doesn't follow you around, literally. I've been followed around in sewers. Privilege is not when you are walking and you are close to a white woman, all of a sudden she clutches her purse tightly. Because the thought is, you're obviously going to steal. That's how it's be important. Privilege. When you go into a car dealership, the person who runs out doesn't say, uh, so you want to buy a used car? Mm -hmm. When you are really looking for a brand new car. Privilege is not going to be relative. Privilege is having a very low death rate for babies. That's privilege. But it's an invisible privilege. And so people don't think of it as such. There are other privileges as well. The privilege that if you do something or say something stupid, it does not reflect that on you. If you're a person of color and you do something stupid, it reflects not only on you, but on everyone else. When I was growing up, I was told, and I got this before I learned anything about whiteness or white privilege. I was taught, and probably a lot of folks who were brought up in the South or with Southern parents um, were taught, <clears throat> whatever you do, if a white person sees you, they'll think that all people are like that. Mm -hmm. And consequently, when I'd go into a bathroom and I'd see paper on the floor, I would make sure I picked it up. Because if I walked out and a white person walked in, obviously I'm the one who did that. I'll give you a counter example. This was not too long ago, because those kinds of things, I figured, hey, we're sophisticated now. We don't need that anymore. I was coming back, um, I'd gone to a conference in Seattle, and I was coming back on the train, and I went to the restroom. I'm waiting outside. A young white woman comes out. I go in, there's people over there. Uh, she was kind of a hippie-looking person. I thought, huh, and then I rethought. But before I left, I decided when I walk out, someone's going to see this, and they're going to imagine it, but on my old training, so what do I do? I it up. A white person, that young lady, had the privilege of not doing that because she didn't associate, if somebody sees me coming up, they'll think all white people are like this. But that's a take that still plays in my mind. So I always act on it? No. But on this case, I thought, hmm. Because it was really, I mean, just paper all over the place. <laughs> and I thought, hmm. That's a privilege. That's part of white privilege. Um, whiteness is like a club. This is not my original thought, but whiteness is like a club that you're born in. You become a member and have privileges without asking for it, and sometimes without even knowing about it. And that's why it's invisible. People do not know about it. They don't think about it. There are, by the way, in addition, material privileges, such as um, earning a good pay. Another privilege, and I was on a committee at PCC about five years ago talking about this, we never um, resolved it, but another privilege is that when you're being interviewed, you're being interviewed in a certain style that may be different from your style. And consequently, you are at a disadvantage or you are at an advantage because of the nature of the questions that are asked and the responses that are expected. So those are all different forms of, um, of white privilege. Um, another, and again we don't think about it, is something like hairstyle. White people are privileged to wear their hair any way they like. Black people are not. Some black hairstyles are considered to be 
unprofessional. Some ways of speech are thought to be unprofessional. You can't do that. You can't say that. You can't look that way. But if you're white in this country, you have the privilege of ignoring those particular views. So, so then the question becomes, can there be a world without whiteness, a world in which um, white privilege doesn't exist, that basically everybody is privileged? Well, there have been times in this country's history when we have lived without whiteness. In colonial times, and if you grew up in this country, you probably had a U.S. history class, and you probably learned about the colonies, and you probably learned about slavery. Um, but you didn't learn everything about slavery. A lot of people thought that all Africans came over here as slaves. That's not true. There are books, history, U.S. history books, that still say things like, the first slaves arrived in Virginia in 1619. Two things. Number one, the first Africans arrived in the 1500s with the Spanish. But in terms of North America, um, Africans did arrive in Virginia in 1619, but they were not slaves. See, sometimes we um, back a story. We know that Africans were slaves, and so we imagine that there were always slaves, and only slaves. So how do you explain that in 1622, there is a black man who is registered on the rolls as a property owner, which meant that he could vote? It's because the first Africans were not slaves. And until 1705, Africans in Virginia could own property. They could own other people as well white and black, we call them indentured servants. And there was no color line. It slowly crept up, and in 1705, there was a color line. Now, the reason I tell you that is because people think, oh, Africans were always slaves, and therefore, that's the way it should have been. The reality is, there was a time period when that didn't exist. There was a time period when whiteness did not <coughs> exist in our history. And if we don't know that, we go in with a wrong attitude. Let me go to a, a completely different um, subject in terms of knowing history and reacting or acting on it. The war in Vietnam was, for my generation, an extremely important event. I, by the way, truth in lending, I was opposed to that war. I demonstrated against it. I even wrote the president and got a response. Not from him, but from Assistant um, Secretary of State. Uh, but one of the things about that war and why President Johnson so doggedly pursued it, and he made this comment to one of his aides, I do not want to be the first American president to lose a war. That's because the president learned the same thing I did. We never lost the war. In the same way that there are six continents, not seven, <coughs> that was not true. The United States did not win the Revolutionary War. Had France not come over, we would be speaking proper English today. We did not win the War of 1812. It was a stalemate. It was a draw. But we didn't lose, so consequently, we must have won. We did not win the Third Seminole War. The Seminoles are still in Florida. We simply declared that we won and moved on. <laughs> I wish that President Johnson had learned that, and therefore he would not think, I am the first president to lose a war. Chief, so, uh, thank you. <laughs> I, I get sometimes a little bit dizzy. Anyway, um, that, that he thought he was the first president to lose a war. Had he known others had lost wars, perhaps he would have 
behave differently. So if you know about history, it changes your viewpoint. So was there a time when there was no whiteness in this country? The answer is yes, up until 1705 in Virginia. It did not exist. Um, Africans and Europeans and American Indians, by the way, intermarried. Why? Because they were all poor people. And poor people had a good relationship with each other. And they intermarried. They considered themselves to be different, but not inferior or superior, simply different. When I teach U.S. history, general U.S. history, I have a subtitle for my class. It's called America's Triple Heritage. And each week, you learn about Europeans, Africans, and Natives, all at the same time. Occasionally someone will say, especially in terms of uh, ethnic histories, like I teach black history, African American history, there's an American history, uh, excuse me, American Indian history, there's a women's history. And occasionally someone will say, well, why don't we have some white history? <laughs> and the reality is, again, it's invisible. What we call U.S. history is white history. It's invisible. That's why we don't have a separate course called white history. But there's a privilege in learning about your ancestors. In France, for example, another um, step aside, in West Africa, uh, I met a man from Guinea, French colony, former French colony. And we're talking about history, and he was talking about the history that he learned in Guinea, which is just north of Sierra Leone in West Africa. And here's what he learned. Our ancestors, the Gauls. Here he is sitting in Africa and he's learning that his ancestors were the Gauls. That was the history that he learned. He was learning how to be French. In our history, for the most part, and it's changed over the last 20 years or so, but for the most part, we learn white American history. And when we learn about others, it's because they're inferior. Like all blacks were slaves. Not true. Never true. Some were, most were, but not all. And that's a whole other topic. So that's one period in which whiteness did not dominate our nation. A second period was right after the Civil War. And that's another controversial type thing. Um, what caused the Civil War? As a historian, I'll tell you, that was slavery. Other folks was, oh, no, 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 no. It was um, differences over trade and economics, etc., etc. There's a book, Cause of the Civil War, there are 12 different causes. Every single one of them at the base has slavery. But that was written out of our history in terms of whiteness after the Civil War. Because the thought was, why would white people fight over whites and black people? It had to be something else. And so something else is invented. The period of time between 1865 and 1876 is called Reconstruction. The Reconstruction that I learned in high school was that it was a terrible time because um, blacks, ignorant blacks, uh, were given the vote and didn't know what to do, and they ruined the country. That was standard. It was also incorrect. Blacks in South Carolina, for example, were the ones who pushed for and achieved a public education system. It did not exist before. They insisted on it because they wanted their children and all other children, but their children educated. And so they pushed for it. They also pushed for rebuilding roads and bridges, and so forth. But when the history was told, it was so, no, they didn't know what they were doing. They were ignorant. It's not their fault. That's what I learned in high school. And that was incorrect. But the point about the Reconstruction era, that's another era in which whiteness did not die. It was an era in which blacks voted, went to Congress, served in the state governments, served as sheriffs, etc., etc. 
and were treated equally anywhere from five to ten years, depending on which state, until the states were, quote, redeemed. In other words, taken over again. The Reconstruction Era is one of the biggest missed opportunities in terms of race relations in the history of this country. We had a chance then to have a real revolution, and it failed. I'll just say this very quickly, and I won't elaborate on it, but one of the reasons for failure was the triumph of something else called capitalism. Businesses. Forget about that. Let's make money, is what happened. That's a short version of something. But it is a time period when things could have happened, things were happening, and we would live in a different world. We would not have to wait until 1875 for another Civil Rights Act. There was one in 1873. We wouldn't have to wait until the, the 1960s in order for education to get better, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a time period when um, whiteness really did not exist. As personal. We had a wonderful Saturday, Sunday. The sun was out, and so was the pollen. <laughs> I will tell you, it was personally the worst weekend I've had since I moved to Oregon. So, excuse me. Okay. Back to <coughs> So those are our previous times uh, when uh, whiteness really did not So, what's happening now is that uh, whiteness is on retreat. There are some demographic bits of information. Uh, it is estimated. Uh, thank you. It is estimated by uh, 2040 or 2050. Um, there will not be a white majority in terms of population. So in reality, by about um, 2040, 2050, and some of us will be there, uh, we'll all be minorities in this country. And that's frightening to some people. Very frightening. Um, but it's something that we need to prepare for. Let me read you a quote from President Bill Clinton. He was at Portland State in 1998. And uh, this is what he said. Today, largely because of immigration, there is no majority race in Hawaii, Houston, Texas, or New York City. Within five years, there will be no majority race in our largest state of California. In a little more than 50 years, as I mentioned, there will be no majority race in the United States. No nation in history has gone through demographic change of this magnitude in such a short time. Furthermore, he says, immigrants are energizing our culture and broadening our vision of the world. They are renewing our most basic values and reminding all of us what it truly means to be an American. We are American because we're born in this country. And for a brief time, we were Americans again. Uh, that brief time was in September of 2001. Um, you may remember that we were all Americans because we all shared this tragedy. I remember um, my old flag was getting worn. It was two months before I could replace it because everybody was buying American flags. And their cars and trucks with double flags. We were all Americans for a short period of time and whiteness seemed to have taken a dip at that time. So it is possible. It is quite possible. But the question is, how do we get people to abandon the concept of whiteness? How do we get people to make that dramatic change? And my thinking is, it takes place one person at a time. Um, an example from East Africa, my pelvis. Mozambique 
was a Portuguese colony. It became independent. And President um, Samora Machel had to unite a number of different tribes. The um, Makua, Songa, Makonde, Shanagan, Shona, and others. And what he said to them was, you have to die. You have to die as a Shona in order to become a citizen of Mozambique. You have to give up that identity. And people need to give up that, their identities as white, meaning I am powerful, I dominate, to see themselves as we are equal. We are Americans. Oh, um, by the way, on a personal level, we need to move away from certain things. For example, um, the angry student, and especially the angry black student. We cannot say things like you're sitting in your office and an angry black student comes in. And I think sometimes the, the statement is, I cannot see through your anger. Possibly. But the question is, does that person have a reason for being angry? And if a white student who was angry came in, would you say the same thing? Or would you simply say, I see you're angry. There is a, uh, a double dealing with that. Um, double dealing also in education. We don't do students of color a favor by passing them on. Uh, sometimes that happens. Oh, they try so hard, and then you pass them on. That's a disservice. I worked at a school, which I will not mention, in which I found out that one of the teachers, who was having, quote, problems with black students, told the black students in the class, if you simply don't make any trouble in class, you'll get a C. And the student told me that I said, that's ridiculous. I said, you're being cheated. Would they say that to a white student is a question. We need to start treating people equally. And that's how you get rid of this concept of whiteness. And it is a concept. It is something that came into existence probably in about the 18th century. And so it has a beginning. And if it has a beginning, there's a possibility that it has an ending. But we need to imagine that something like that uh, can happen. Oh, um, another, uh, another thing that we need to get rid of, and this is for, um, for black students especially, the, the concept of, quote, acting white, which came about in the 1960s. Acting white meant doing things that white people do. And um, you, you get berated by other blacks for doing that. For example, doing all your homework on time, being polite. You're acting white. White people do it, so we can't do it. And that's because whiteness is the power structure. And in the 19, late 1960s, um, there was a tremendous pushback against that power structure. And so the idea was just do the opposite. And there's some black students who need to get out of that because there's still some who are in that mindset that if white people do it, I'm not going to do it. And that's all related as well to, um, to whiteness. The um, individual approach there's several of these quotes, but I'll give you one of them. Um, Margaret Mead. Never believe that a few caring people can change the world, for indeed, that's all who ever have. In 1831, William Lloyd Garrison, a New Englander, began publishing a newspaper called The Liberator. And in The Liberator, in the first edition, 
He said basically that he was against slavery and he wanted it abolished immediately. Not gradually, but immediately. He was one of a few people who felt that way. I remember when I learned about the abolitionists, I learned again incorrectly that all the Northerners were abolitionists. That's not true. The, the abolitionists were looked upon as gadflies that were not liked in the North and in the South. But Wade Lloyd Garrison and a few other people, black and white, began a protest against slavery that led 30 years later to a war that ended slavery. It took 30 years. But they were persistent and they brought about that particular change. Slavery, by the way, was something that was legal, it was supported by the government, and yet they opposed it. So in the same way, what each of us needs to do, little by little, is to start opposing this whole whiteness structure. Little by little, we need to um, dismantle whiteness, as one article um, put. And we dismantle it by taking personal action. So, can we live in a world without whiteness? My answer is yes, we can, because it's happened before. And it all revolves around individuals taking small steps to dismantle and demolish the whole concept. But the first thing you need to do um, is to imagine. And in the same way that you cannot imagine Colleen, um, you can't just listen to me and say, oh, that sounds good. What you need to do is take the time to read more about whiteness and what it does. So that when people speak with you, you can speak um, intelligently about whiteness, that you know something about it, and that you know how to personally begin to so, we need to make, for example, education um, more than multicultural. It should be anti-racist. That you definitely teach about race and how to demolish it. Uh, multiculturalism, by the way, is wonderful. I, I practice it. It's a good step, but it's a first step. We need to move on to be um, anti-racist. Let me just end, and if you have any questions or comments, um, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you will join us, and the world will live as one. Thank you all very much.